And the lesson tonight is uh, we're going to go to session two of Nehemiah 2, 1 through 20. And it's talking about a kingdom calling. But what I really think is important in Nehemiah 2, verse 8, is the fact that the good hand of my God is upon me. That's a statement made in this that Nehemiah made. And he really follows the footsteps, and I'll probably read some of his uh, from Ezra. Ezra used that several times in, in his book. So where it be said, one person can make a big difference in the world, and that person knows God and really trusts in him. Because faith makes a difference, we can make a difference in our world to the glory of God. Martin Luther said, faith is living, daring confidence in God's grace. The promise is that all things are possible to him who believe. And that's from Mark 9, 23. Jesus said, living by faith can move mountains. Matthew 17, 20. And another thing about this lesson today, uh, tonight, is about Nehemiah actually starting to see the mountain move when he's going to get ready to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So that's kind of, he, he was a mountain mover. So there's three evidences of Nehemiah's faith. He had, and I kind of brought some of this up last week, but he had the faith to wait. Uh, a lot of times we can become very impatient. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 3 talked about that. Three statements in scripture have a calming effect on me. This is where is he talking. Three statements of scripture have a calming effect on me. Whenever I get nervous and want to rush ahead on the Lord, and this is the first one, stand still and see the salvation of our Lord, Exodus 14, 13. Sit still until you know how the matter will turn out, Ruth 3, 18. And then be still and know, uh, and know uh, that I am, let's see, be still, and I've probably made a type in error here. Be still and know um, that I am God. Yes, that I am God. Psalm 46.10. Thank you. When you wait on the Lord in prayer, you're not waiting, wasting time. You're investing it. God is preparing both you and your circumstances so his purpose will be accomplished. However, when we are, whenever when, when the right time arrives for us to act by faith, we dare not delay. Nehemiah had waited four months since hearing the news from back home. He prayed with boldness, calling for repentance and a plan to rebuild. And uh, just to follow up with that, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, how the King James pray without ceasing, he had, in Nehemiah 4, 80, he said, he had the faith to ask. And that's, that's from after praying, he had the faith to ask. Then uh, in verse 4, the king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to, to God of heaven, I replied, if, if it pleases the king and if you are pleased with me, your servant send me to Judea and rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? And after I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judea. On, and, please, and please give me a letter addressed to Asa, the manager of the king's force, instructing him to give me timber I will need to make uh, the beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for the house for myself. And the king granted this request because the gracious hand of God was on him. And uh, so going into this, the star of Nehemiah set the, the standard up first was to pray. But then also he had a plan. He, he didn't just dream this up. He had four months to plan ahead to what he was going to do. Interesting, when you look back at Ezra, 
Uh, one of the little differences in here, uh, the king sent his soldiers to help guard him when he went back, Nehemiah. But Ezra turned the king down and didn't want that help because he had faith that the strong hand of God would be upon him. So that's kind of one of the little differences there. Another note from Wearsby was, not only had Nehemiah uh, prayed for the opportunity, but he planned for the opportunity, but he had also planned for, prayed for the opportunity, and he also had planned for it. And he had his answer ready. So when he met the king, he already had a plan in place, and he was ready to give answers to the king on how he was going to go about this. During those four months waiting, he had thought the matter through and knew exactly how he would approach the project. Uh, his reply to the king came summarized in two requests. Send me, and that's out of verses 4 through 6, and give me, 7 through 10. So he wasn't afraid to ask the king for those things. So, um, things we're going to look at here for tonight is, uh, when we look at this uh, video. We can exercise our trust in God by working to bring restoration to our broken world and believing his sovereignty. Uh, to know that God holds ultimate power over every circumstance. To feel in bold, bold in, uh, in by God's sovereignty and purpose for his people and to exercise trust in God by taking courageous steps towards accomplishing God's mission. Have you ever been dared to do something but didn't do it? And what was the dare and why didn't you go through with it? Have you ever been dared or double dared? <laughs> double dog dared? Double dog dared? Have you ever been That's double dog yeah. dared? Yeah. I probably have, but I don't remember. I mean, it would have been when I was just, you know, like in school and stuff like that, but it hasn't been this long ago. I, don't, I can't really remember that part back. Well, I was there once, but I was dumb enough to go ahead through with the dare. And I remember we hung a rope out of the hayloft at my grandpa's barn and tied it to a bunch of concrete blocks down. Uh, oh, probably 50 feet away with this rope. And then I had a, uh, uh, oh, a roller. Pulley. 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 And, and so I, it's, I guess it was zip lining before it was zip lining. It was, <laughs> uh, the only problem with this deal, and I, the dare was, as I went out, it immediately came undone and dropped me straight down. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I wished I would have declined that dare, but I went ahead and went with that dare. There are several reasons we don't go through with a dare, but the core session, this core session is what we don't trust something or, when some, uh, or someone. Life presents us with, with opportunities to take risks and, and risks outweigh our trust. We won't go through them, uh, won't go through with them. In session two, Eric will share how Nehemiah responded to the risk he faced in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We will observe how Nehemiah's trust in God's power prompted him to boldly move forward with the assignment God had given him. And again, it was kind of a very, I mean, when you look at Ezra, kind of the person needs to follow. Go back and look at Ezra after we get done with this study to kind of see the, the similar patterns that, that went on between Ezra and then Nehemiah. And uh, so we're looking at 2, 1 through 20. Uh, we have made a day, um, and that's in our, I see, okay, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm ready for the film. Things we're going to look for. How does God's sovereignty play a role in Nehemiah's uh, position? And how does Nehemiah respond to the opportunity given to him by God? So let's go ahead and take a look at this video. I 
lot of famous people and even uh, well-to-do people have grown up in very, very difficult contexts, whether it's a third world country or whether it's an inner city in America. And one of the things that's always beautiful that when they make it out of there, they never forget about it and they still have a heart for it no matter what's going on, no matter how high in life that they've gotten. Um, and we see that in the book of Nehemiah. We see there can be a level for them of stability and being the cupbearer to the king had probably a level of stability to it as that person is right there with the king on a regular basis. But one of the things that we know about God, particularly uh, because in Jeremiah it says, he wants them to be a witness to the place where he sent them. So when God sends you somewhere, when he places you somewhere, he places you in those positions uh, because it's a part of his plan of a way to utilize it and recycle it to help other people. So we see Nehemiah has already prayed and asked God uh, to work through everything that is happening in Jerusalem because the walls have been destroyed and the city is in turmoil and the people are having a difficult time. And so Nehemiah still had to go to work. So when he goes to work, we, 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 we know that some time has passed. And it says, during the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, meaning he was his cupbearer, so he set the wine before him. So I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why are you sad? It's interesting because he's before the king and his continence is falling. And so what this could happen to him is he could actually get killed uh, based on bringing his personal issues into the presence of the king. And like, you, like we say today, killing the vibe and the atmosphere of everything. But interestingly enough, he says, this is nothing but sadness of heart, which lets you know in some ways that Nehemiah has some type of favor and relationship with the king. He said, I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, he was overwhelmed with fear. Why? Because he could have gotten killed. He said, may the king live forever. <laughs> Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed with fire? And so what he was able to do is he was able to let the king know exactly what was going on. And he focused it not on what he needed personally. He focused it really on what God's kingdom needed at that particular time. And the king responded, interestingly enough, he said, then the king asked me, what is your request? And when he asked him, what is your re request? I like what happens here. And we see something that has been a staple and mark for the entire book of Nehemiah. He prayed. Prayer is a real strong mark over and over and over again throughout the book of Nehemiah to show that in order for God's kingdom and his work to get done, it has to be based in a significant amount of prayer. And we can't undermine the place of prayer. Remember, prayer is not our dictation of our will to God. It's our alignment with it. But prayer is God's uh, mechanism and tool that he's given to us uh, to unlock things that he wants to do on earth. Let me say that again. Prayer is a tool that God has given man to unlock things that he wants to to do on earth and so he lets him know he, he begins praying and then he goes forward and he says and answer the king if it pleases the king i like the way he's professional uh he, he, he doesn't lose his cool he's professional he says if it pleases the king if your servant has found favor with you send me to judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that i may rebuild it he had what's called a clear vision in other words he understood the problem and he had a clear vision let's say that again he had uh, an understanding of problem, that means awareness, and then he had vision, and then he had strategy. So, so what do we see here? The wall is destroyed, awareness, vision, rebuild it, strategy. He'll see that in a second as he begins to work through leveraging what it means to use his position to the glory of God. I've got telling you and working through in your life how you can leverage what God has put in your sphere um, for someone else. I, I, I know that uh, in many of our lives, God has providentially and sovereignly placed us places. Let's talk about this. So sovereignty. Sovereignty is God's control and rule over all creation. God's providence, though, is the hidden and unseen ways 
what God seemingly uses the everyday things as a way to bring forth his will. Maybe you're put in a place where you can leverage uh, the resources that you have and the opportunities that you have to invest in places that need investment. I used to work for an organization uh, in Dallas, and this organization in Dallas was happened to be an inner city organization. This was like in the 90s when I worked there. And one of the presidents of the organization ran a security company. And when he went uh, to the inner city and saw the type of challenges that were in the southern part of Dallas, he was from the northern side of Dallas. So he had leverage, but he also knew that it would have had to have been a partnership. It just wasn't him condescending down to South Dallas and West Dallas and bringing kind of all of what he felt like he can bring there. No, he partnered with the woman whose son got killed. He partnered with people that were already seeking the shalom of that aspect and that part of Dallas. And to this day, that organization has flourished even though he's passed away. And um, that uh, you, you, you can't um, put into words and even fathom how much work God has done over there. Everything from jobs development, uh, feedings, uh, uh, everything from skill set development. All of these different things have been transformative means to help people in that particular area. Now, when we talk about what's going on in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah wants to work with the king. And why would he want to work with the king? And what is important about why he's able to? Because he had the character to be able to ask the king for stuff. Let me say that again. He had the character to ask the king for stuff. Listen, you can want to do kingdom work all you want, but if people don't trust your character, because he's going to be sent away. He's like, how long do you need? And he goes off and he goes on a journey to Jerusalem, trusting that he's going to come back. Because why was he able to trust that he was able to come back? Because Nehemiah has shown himself faithful in the position that he was in so that when he leveraged uh, the weight of the relationship uh, that he was able to utilize with Artaxerxes, he was able to be trusted with um, the opportunity to go do that. But not only that, he was also given resources. So he was literally given grant money. He was given cedar wood and all different types of soldiers that was able to escort him down in letters of recommendation to make sure that he had the way open for him to be able to do what God called him to do. Man, I, I would love to see um, there to be an onslaught of us, as, of the people of God, utilizing and leveraging individually and corporately um, those opportunities uh, for the city and beyond. Um, my spiritual father, he leveraged his relationship with government to be able to bring resources in to start organizations in the community. Another guy in Washington, D.C., who I grew up under, uh, he was able to leverage his relationship with government to start senior living housing for people whose retirement, because of inflation, couldn't even live in a particular place because it was too expensive. But he was able to get grant money to help build these uh, 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 senior uh, citizen apartments for seniors to be able to live in. Listen, there are a multitude of ways that we, as the people of God, can leverage. So uh, the question is, lastly, or do you have the courage for it? Do you have the courage for it? It took courage, it took character, it took competency, and it took commitment for Nehemiah to leverage all that he had experienced under Artaxerxes and that relationship that he was building in order to help the people of God build the kingdom and strengthen the kingdom. And so I pray that that's something that we would do as the people of God nationally and internationally. And not just leveraging it for things in our own spheres, but leveraging it for work globally. One of the things that we leverage our resources for is to help build a school in Malawi um, through our ministry and through our church because girls uh, were getting raped walking in the rain uh, to school for two hours. And so we built it right in their community. And because of that, the government ended up uh, building the first water lines out to that part of Malawi. Guess what? So that they can have water lines and experience more shalom in that area. And guess what ended up happening? The church in that area, we, we didn't take credit for it. We let the churches take credit for it. Why do we want the churches to take credit for it? Because we wanted the glory of God to be on the work of God through those pastors and leaders in that area so that it opened doors for them to leverage for the gospel of peace. So that, that's, that's why Titus 3.14 says, let us learn to meet pressing needs in order that we may be, not be found unfruitful. Jesus Christ in his ministry did miracles for, for a particular reason. Every miracle that Jesus did wasn't for miracle's sake. Every miracle that Jesus did was something to point to him. Every work and miracle and way that we leverage where God has placed us for others is a way to point to Jesus. At the end of the day, 
that's what our goal is and that's what our desire is. Something I was thinking about while uh, going through that and watching this video, um, you know, Nehemiah went back to rebuild the gates of Jerusalem, and and then again he was talking about uh, when he's talking about that Jeremiah verse that we need to be prosper in the area that we're placed. So I was thinking about those gates, and those gates that we need to rebuild aren't to keep people out. They're to bring people, to open up and let people in. If those gates are broken down, they might be a hindrance that they can't get in. So that's why we need to rebuild the gates is to let people in. And we're gonna to have to go outside of those gates though to help bring them in. Nehemiah too emphasizes God's sovereignty and how Nehemiah took the initiative to bring restoration to Jerusalem. We will walk through the chapter to observe how Nehemiah displayed his trust in God through his bold actions. And I think right now, I'm gonna just stop. Let's read Nehemiah 1 through 20. And so I need somebody to take the first 10 verses and somebody to take the last. One, two, huh? chapter two. Chapter two, okay. one through 20. I'll take the first 10. And it came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. And I had been sad, I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire. Then the king said to me, Why would you, what would you request? So I prayed to God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, if it pleased the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber <coughs> to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of God was on me. Then I came to the governors of the provinces beyond the river, gave them the king's letter. Now the king had said, had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. This is my take over from my wife, please. I will. Go ahead. <clears throat> I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. <clears throat> I have not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one that I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal, well in the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by, my, by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, 
Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But Sanballat and the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Gishon the Arab heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Thank you. Eric shared the God the the, the Eric shared that God's sovereignty is God's control and rule over all creation. God holds authority over all our circumstances that he either allows or causes to happen. It is, is it hard for you to grasp God's sovereignty? Why or why not? I so. think it is because if it's, as humans, we can't, or at least I can't envision someone having all power. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, to whoever they want. It's just something that I have a hard time wrapping my mind around. That powerful, I guess. Anybody else? I think when to think about God, to, to know that He is, but yet He doesn't just wipe out evil or mm, yeah. you know mm. heal people and all that. I mean, that's what makes it hard. Not that it's hard for me to accept it, but people might think, well, if he is, why doesn't he fix those problems? Exactly. I mean, and then you can look at it from the standpoint, why doesn't he heal some people? Why doesn't he, you know, in all this uh, sovereignty, why doesn't he heal some people? Exactly. Why do some people have to go through what they go through? Right. And that's part of it. Well, and you hear a lot of people say, well, God is so good, but why doesn't he fix these things that are going on in the world? And I said, well, we're the ones that created them. He didn't. I mean, that's what I try to explain to him because we are the ones that's really messed, messed it up. He didn't. He made it perfectly right for us. But we're the ones by our sin of what's messed it up. From the fall it started. Exactly. From the fall it started. And it hasn't gotten much better. No, it has not. And they don't like hearing that either. But you know, it, really it is our fault. But God's grace can fix it if we do our part. Okay, so Eric pointed out that God's sovereignty is uh, on display because God put Nehemiah in a strategic position as a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah was uniquely positioned to help his people. Has God ever placed you in a strategic position to help others? If so, what were the circumstances? I truly believe we're all put in places where God wants us to be at and hopefully share what, uh, be a light where we're at, where whatever work we're in, wherever we're at. Uh, I think we get placed in places that way to hopefully uh, show the love of God to a world that needs it so bad. Anybody else think about that? I think he places us in this church at the right time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we talked a little bit last week about this too, though. You know, this church is in this spot. Yeah. For a reason, and that reason is all around us. And uh, I mean, what's sad is you look down the street. There's two other churches that are sitting and now that are living quarters for people. And uh, and, and, uh, and I talked a little bit about that little church I went to in Bethel, uh, being out in the country where it was at. But again, it was for all of us to reach out to our surroundings. And again. I kind of go back to that thought about the gate building. 
the gates are to be open to let them in, not to, to, to keep them out. And we have to remember that. Are you thinking about some of your, yeah, like you're in deep thought about something? I was going to say, even if, if God has sovereignly placed us where he has, individually, then we have to be willing to accept that we might be instrumental in being the answer to our own prayer. Hmm. For example, similar to what I was saying earlier, we can pray for someone that is wandering. They're not where they ought to be spiritually. They're not coming to church. Um, and and you all know that I know that you can come to church and still not be right spiritually. Mm -hmm. You know I know that. That's not what I'm talking about. But we can pray that prayer. Lord, get a hold of them. Lord, mm -hmm. send someone. Lord, somehow get through to them. Well, I mean, we might. We might just assume that, like, maybe I'm the someone. Maybe I'm the one that has to go say that to that person. Maybe I'm the one that has to send the annoying text. On and on and on. I, you know, we, we just have to be willing. And I, I get it. It's hard. I, I, nobody likes rejection. And Satan's good at making us feel like, boy, I might just push him farther. Well, maybe. But, I mean... <laughs> They're not where they ought to be now, so it's not like it's going to be okay if they end up there. So sometimes I think God's sovereignty has placed us, but we have to understand what that means is we're the tool that he's put in this one spot. You know, like you said, they already don't come, so how much farther can we really push them by asking them to come? Right. You know, we're not going to be their hindrance. Right. And and I'm not suggesting, you know, that we're not as careful as we can be. Nehemiah was careful in the way he approached the king. You know, when the king said, your countenance is something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, you understand that the king, his life is in Nehemiah's hands. He has a vested interest in Nehemiah not going around with a bad look on his face. Because maybe this is the day he's struggling with the idea that there's poison in there and he knows it. The king wants to know, what's going on? So Nehemiah has got to be willing to like put all that aside and, and say, this is what's going on. And there's, you know, he, he had to be willing to stand up and say, this is what's bothering me. The king, yeah. there was a chance of rejection. There was a chance that the whole thing ends and it's not in the Bible. Yeah. There's a chance he says, you know what? I mean, Pharaoh had a cupbearer. And you know that because you read about him being in prison. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that Nehemiah could have been put in prison. It could have been the end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that guy, uh, Xerxes, he had the power of life and death over those people. So he just had to trust that Good, bad, or ugly, this is what we're doing. He went for it. Well, in order to, for uh, Nehemiah to keep his, I mean, character and being trustworthy, uh, the fact, fact he had to rely a tremendous amount on God because he was drinking the wine that was going to go before the king. And that couldn't have been a really easy task. No, <laughs> one sip from uh, at, at one, mm -hmm. that one point could be the end of it all. So, yeah. I would say, okay, so God is trustworthy, and we can follow him even when, we, when we're afraid, in pain, or worried about the future. While Nehemiah trembled at the thought of the king harming him and preventing him from the work he felt convinced to do, he still acted. Have you ever had a moment when you pushed past the fear and acted? What motivated you? Made it, what motivated you to take initiative, even though you were afraid? Can you say that again, please? Okay. God's trust, God is trustworthy, and we can follow him even when we're afraid, in pain, or worried about the future. While Nehemiah trembled at the thought of the king harming him or preventing him from the work he felt convicted to do, he still acted. 
Have you ever had a moment when you pushed past your fear and acted? What motivated you to take initiative even though you were afraid? Well, I mentioned before there was, there was a guy down here at the high rise. Rose and I was walking the dog and uh, a couple of years ago. And I saw him leaving, walking over to the to IGAs. And uh, as we was walking along, I just felt like you need to go pray for him. Didn't know him, didn't, and I can't make any excuses. Well, you know, just we're walking the dog, you know, with my wife. And, and we got about a half block down, and I told her she's gonna have to go on because I had to go back. And, and I caught him before he got into the store. I can't call his name right now, I've got it written down. But I just stopped and asked if I could pray with him. Um, he's never been to church. I've only seen him two or three times since then. Um, but it was just one of those things that, I don't know if I was afraid, but maybe it was a little bit, but I just went ahead and listened to what I knew that God wanted me to do and just, you know, kind of, I guess, overcome my fear and went ahead and did it. Like I said, I may never see any, may never have had an effect on him, I don't know. But it might, sometime. Mm -hmm. So it's that still, still small voice that's yeah. kind of pushing you along to make that make that contact. Yeah. Uh, you don't know how it's going to come off. It's probably easier to do it with a stranger than it is one of your close friends because you don't know what's going to happen yeah. after you make that initiative. Uh, so that's just one of the thoughts. Nehemiah trusted in God's guidance and sovereign power. His sovereign power propelled him to take bold steps to accomplish the mission God gave him. Like Nehemiah, our level of trust in God is often revealed through our obedient words, actions, and attitudes. In what areas of your life might you need to trust in God's sovereignty? Well, I know in my own view, I need to trust more in having the, the nerve to speak out to friends or whatnot. I mean, one thing for sure, you can live it out loud in front of them. Uh, or try not to give them a reason. That's one of the things that, that won Nehemiah's trust of the king was the fact his character. And so it's our character that people are watching all the time. And uh, again, I said this last week, and I'll say it again about that one person that parks his truck in front of the church mm -hmm. now. His character had changed so much. Now people can see that new character that he has. And so we all have that same thing that we're living out loud is that character that people see in us. Any thoughts about that? Well, I, 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 you can put it in religion. I didn't learn it in a religious background, but it's the saying that people don't, I can't think of how to say it. People don't know how much you care. Oh, they yeah, don't care well, how much you know. Pardon? They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> you went to the same class. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When Nehemiah 6 through 10, even though God was sovereign over Nehemiah's situation, Nehemiah knew he would still face opposition and would need to gather supplies. So he was proactive in verses 7 through 8. He asked the king for letters to provide safe passage and resources to rebuild the wall. And, uh, and so what has it looked like for you to be proactive in your faith? And uh, what ways did God's sovereignty play a role in how and why you acted? Have you ever had to go before a church board and ask for, thought you needed to do something different, a new program, a new whatever? I'm just thinking out loud. That was just one thing I was thinking about. Um, Adam, wait, who's the... 
One, I can't remember. Easter or Christmas. When not our families in Florida, but everybody else was there at our daughters. And I just felt like the Lord said, you really need to tell them all to sit down and listen. You know, and there was 12, 14 of us there that day, but kind of like what you said, you know, it's it's not us and who. Mm-hmm. You know, and I felt like the Lord, he wasn't going to let me away from that. And it is harder with, I think, sometimes with family yeah. than it is strangers. But it shouldn't be, should it? Because they know, no. they know, they've seen us our whole life. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But, but it, it is. And, but we talk to them, and one helped me, and we talk to them about how we have, we don't know that we have tomorrow. You know, and we just kind of said, you need to stop playing around and <laughs> be serious. But and we got to love them, they knew that. But, you know, the Lord gave me peace about it because. I follow what he asked me to do. That's really all he ever asked is just mm-hmm. to obey. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think, uh, and I'm just going to wrap this and wrap up on this, but you know, when you when you look at this, uh, I mean, first of all, the character of Nehemiah that he, he that he lived out loud in front of the king got him uh, the, the favor of the king, and and then Nehemiah knew it because he had the strong hand of God upon him. So he had this, the confidence that God was going to help him through that situation and that he could go back and rebuild. Then the one thing you, that uh, when you look at when he did get back there, he already run right into opposition. Mm-hmm. He'd come back to help. And then there was those people that were in power, Sam Ballant and those guys. And so there they were already ready to not want to receive him or criticize him. The interesting thing about his character was he didn't just come in there riding in and just, you know, this is what we're going to do. He snuck out at night. He took inventory of what he seen that needed to be done. And then he implemented the plan. And that plan was all put in place. He had the he had the wherefore to get the timber. He had the uh, all that. And then, if you read chapter three, uh, read chapter three, how many people came forward? How many different ones that came forward? So this one was going to rebuild this gate and his family. This one was going to build that gate and rebuild that gate. Well, this is a family, and we got to start rebuilding. We got to start. F- working on these gates and rebuild and, and open those gates up to our community. Anything else about this lesson? Um, one thing I, I noticed here today, it says uh, back in verse 9, uh, I came to the governors and I gave them the king's letters. So he, he gave the letters to Sam Ballot and Tobiah and all these others. And then down here when they started actually doing it, uh, Sam Ballot you know, mentioned What's this thing you're doing? You're rebelling against the king? Yeah. Well, you already know what we're doing. I gave you the letters, you know, last week. You know what we're doing. But yet, they still tried to wheedle in somewhere or another to, to make them, I guess, quit before they started. Well, I mean, it's all we've always had that influence in the church. There's always been that group. There's always been that ones that don't want to progress something because they want it done their way. Yeah. Instead, they want it God's way. And so it's always, and that's kind of why I looked at what Sam Bell and those boys were doing was they didn't want to uh, conform because they wanted it their way. Well, and they, again, go ahead. They were, see, but that they're already evidence of partial obedience because it says that Sam Balat was a Horonite and the other guy was an Ammonite. Those people were supposed to have been wiped out of the. Uh, promised land way back with Joshua and they didn't carry you through all the way and it caused them all this trouble and those guys now are the ones that are there it's like another layer of judgment on the people from God because that's supposed to be Israel but here are these people that are sort of in charge and that's kind of what our lesson was this morning out of Deuteronomy verse 7 was the God had told them to destroy all the evidences of all those tri- different tribes. Mm-hmm. And so that's what you're going on. Somebody snuck through, and so now it's coming back. That's what happens when we don't get it, the God's business taken care of. 
as I mentioned this morning in the lesson, you know, too bad they didn't listen to what God told them to do. Mm -hmm. And now their ancestors or their descendants are paying the price. But we even talked about it though. He didn't say to kill them. No. He just wanted them to take away all the things that they were doing. Their, all their idols. And we all always them. thought, most of us thought that when he said destroy them, he meant to literally get rid of them. And that's not always the way scripture reads. And I didn't know until this morning. If that's what God meant. Anything else that spoke out to you? Kathleen, you've been really quiet this evening. <laughs> well, I'm tired. <laughs> Cousins camp. <laughs> Cousins camp. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we love you so much. Father, we realize that we are in the kingdom building business and, and that you've given us a responsibility to share our witness with the world is hurting so bad but it's also just our neighborhood is hurting so bad so help us realize that the task is at hand and that we have to uh, help to rebuild with your power and with your hand upon us give us that kind of strength and that kind of confidence that Nehemiah had to uh, to start this rebuilding process help us evaluate where we're at Help us uh, look at our neighborhood and see how we can better it, which we know we can because we have the salvation of Jesus Christ at hand that we can share. And nothing would be greater than eternal life to share with somebody. So give each one of us that kind of uh, a confidence like Nehemiah. Uh, give us the character that they would be able to see you in us. And then again, just help us as we go about our week to do so. We're grateful for the salvation of Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the help of your indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so help us use his power to have the words to say to that person that we're struggling with. Give us those words. So again, I just thank you for this church and all those people in it and just help us to meet their needs, but more importantly, meet this neighborhood's needs. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we say something real quick? Yeah.